Well, we know very well how to solve second order linear differential equations that have constant coefficients. Well, in this section, we're going to begin looking at applications of those differential equations. Specifically, it's going to be um, spring mass systems. Uh, there aren't the, the best examples um, of such differential equations would be a spring and a mass and you stretch the spring and the mass goes up and down, or a, maybe a pendulum. And then uh, you can put a system like that into water or into some viscous liquid that provides resistance against it, or you can have um, a dash pot on a closing door. You know, those things that prevent the door from slamming We'll take all that into consideration and basically we just want to come up with the function, the solution that says what is the position of this mass, if it's on the spring, what is the position of it at a particular time? So linear models, <clears throat> we know that second order initial value problems uh, start out with, with this equation and of course I, I left off the initial values um, but it would just be y at time zero equals y zero, and then y prime at time zero is equal to, say, y one. That would be the initial value problem we're looking at, <clears throat> the general case. Um, y of t, the solution is called the output or the, or the response of the system. And usually for us, and probably every time, it's gonna be the position of the object at a, at a given time, the position with respect to given to a time. GT on G of T on the right is the input that you, you could have a spring mass system. You can have them going this way or up and down, but you could have a, an external force that keeps it going forever. And that's what we'll represent with this function G of T a driving or forcing function. Well, we need to get a little bit out of this diagram. <clears throat> the spring mass system. Take the mass out of it for now. Here is a hanging spring, and this script L is just going to be the length of the, of the spring with no weight on the end of it. So this is the unstretched. L is called the natural length of the string. Spring. Then we attach a mass to the end of it and let it come down and wherever it stops, comes to a complete stop, this is an equilibrium position. So it's at rest, it's not moving up and down, it's completely at rest. And the distance that it moved from the unstretched uh, natural length down to this equilibrium is what we're going to call S. And that distance, S, would be a number. For our purposes, completely characterizes the spring. All we care about is when you put a mass on the end of it, how far will it stretch the string? <clears throat> and then the third one is, now we've got motion involved. These two are still. This one, think of it as going up and down, and this is just a snapshot in time. X is going to be the distance away from equilibrium. So, I guess I um, wasn't too consistent here. X is going to be my position, where up here in this general example, I have Y as being the uh, output or the response. <clears throat> but it'll be X or Y, usually. So, for our purposes, because the textbook does it this way, many textbooks don't, we're going to consider downward to be positive value for x, upward will be negative. So when at some instant x stops right here, x is zero here. It's negative, zero, positive, zero. And in general, just a term we use for how high it goes in both directions, how low it goes here and how high it goes here, the very farthest it reaches <clears throat> um, would be considered the amplitude. So if you called that A, it would go down 
plus a back up to negative a, plus a, negative a. Now that's in a system where it's a perfect world, no friction, no air, no wind, um, and then it would continually go up from a, now from a, negative a, a, negative a. Okay, so now a little bit of the theory. Hooke's law says that the, the spring force is equal to k times s. We've seen, um, we saw what s was. s was the, um, the distance that the weight pulls, stretches the spring, and is, and is at rest. k is called the spring constant. Then we also know that force equals mass times acceleration. I called that number one, equation number one. It's Newton's second law of motion. And later when I write this, this acceleration is going to be the second derivative of the position. You know, velocity would be the first derivative of position. And then acceleration is the second derivative of position. <clears throat> now, at least for the first half of this uh, section we're in, we're only going to consider the downward force of gravity and the spring force. Um, so that means um, the damping forces. I said if you put the whole system into water, we're not going to have that. But we're going to assume absolutely no forces of friction, wind, anything like that. Okay, so at equilibrium, the two forces are equal. When it's just sitting there in its equilibrium state, Mass times gravity, mass times acceleration, uh, gravity being the acceleration in that case, is equal to Ks. So you can come up with this simple equation. There's zero force. The sum of the forces is zero. Up upward force, downward force, they're at equilibrium. While it's stretched out, we change it just a little bit. Remember what S is. It's the distance from the natural length of the, of the spring to how far the weight brings it down at its equilibrium point. So instead of just using S, we're now going to add S plus X. There's motion, <clears throat> motion involved. Something, we pulled it down, stretched it, it's going up and down. We're now going to use S plus X in its place. So the force, mass times gravity, minus K times this sum. <clears throat> But equations one and two together, and here's where I'm going to use the second derivative of position instead of acceleration, right here. This is ma. F is this, and F is this. So the two Fs are equal. Left-hand side is ma. Right-hand side is all of this. I just distributed there. But up here, we know that at equilibrium, we showed that mg minus ks is zero, so that goes away. But after all that, we get this differential equation. Um, I, a little bit of algebra, I, let's see, what did I do? I put this one to, to away, I added kx to both sides, and then I divided both sides by m, so I had a coefficient of one right here. This is really a simple uh, uh, differential equation to solve. And k and m, they're not variables. We will know what they are. They're constants. So k over m is just some real number. Now we do one more little thing to make things work out more nicely. We let omega be radical k over m. <clears throat> so then this equation becomes this equation. Oh, sorry. I wrote that incorrectly. This should be omega squared. <clears throat> okay, so in a minute I'm going to write down, well actually we'll kind of go through how we solve that. It's really very simple. Um, this is like um, x double prime, so we use the characteristic equation. We get m squared plus omega squared equals zero. 
and then we solve it for m, so we get um, m squared equals negative omega squared. Now omega is a positive number. We get, why is that? Because k and m are both positive, positive numbers. So m is equal to i, we're taking the square root of um, negative omega squared. It's going to be just i w, the plus or minus sign in front of it. Plus or minus i w. <clears throat> it's very simple, but if you need to, you can plug that into the quadratic formula. I just use the square root property, radical both sides, and put a plus or minus on the right. The negative sign under the radical becomes an i when you pull it out, and radical w omega squared is just omega. <clears throat> okay, so our general solution is, you may remember this, I, I think we used a plus bi before, um, where our a here is a zero, it's zero plus or minus, I omega, make sure that looks like an omega, not a W. So the general solution is X of T is C1 cosine omega T plus C2 sine omega T. So So it's not hard to, to get from this differential equation to this, but you could just re memorize this and it might make life easier. So in this equation, if I had more room, I was going to call this equation 4 and then state a few things about equation number 4. Um, I'm going to squeeze them in down here, but T, capital T, equals 2 pi divided by omega is the period of motion. So that's, it's, a, it's how many seconds it takes to go uh, do one full period of, of the function. Um, and I hate to go below this, but I'm going to. F equals 1 over capital T it's going to be the frequency of motion this the units of that would be 1 over seconds or the number of cycles per second and then we already said this one um, omega is k over m underneath a radical, and we call that the circular or angular frequency of oscillation. I'm going to say is angular, angular frequency. Again, you could also call that the uh, circular frequency, and it's of oscillation. And then the last one is, let's see, um, just a note. Both F and omega over 2 pi and notice that F is the reciprocal of t, the period of motion, which would be omega over 2 pi, so it's two ways of saying the same thing, or the natural frequency, called natural frequency. So at the end here, we just got a couple of definition terms. I hope you can see that. Um, F and omega over 2 pi, which are equal, um, is called the natural frequency.